Well, if you have your Bibles, open to Daniel chapter 4. I sure do miss seeing all you folks that have talked to many of you on the phone, over text or, or on, on the phone. And I pray that you're doing well. I pray for you. I pray that God will bless you during this time. He'll strengthen you during this time. And this morning, we're going back to the book of Daniel. You know, we looked at Daniel chapter 1, where Daniel stood up against the culture. Daniel had to eat something different, and God blessed him so that he was 10 times smarter and 10 times healthier, all right, than anyone else. Then we saw in Daniel chapter 2 where Daniel was able to interpret, because of God's grace and help, a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. A dream that no one else could, could figure out because they didn't know what the dream was. And yet God, who is the revealer of secrets, revealed to Daniel not only the dream but the interpretation. Daniel chapter 3 is the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this morning, I would like to look at Daniel chapter 4. I'm entitled the message, When God Wants Your Attention. When God Wants Your Attention. If you would, look with me in a, a couple of verses. We'll end up looking at the whole chapter, though we will not read it all right now. If you look in verse number 1 through 3 at first, where the Bible says in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Then if you were to look at the end of the chapter, in verse number 37 of Daniel chapter 4, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and to those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. I see this chapter, and I see the chapter encapsulated by uh, some statements by Nebuchadnezzar. Some statements that I believe show a turning, a repentance to the God of the universe, the God of heaven. A desire to worship Him and a desire to exalt God, the Almighty God. But in between verses 1, 2, and 3 and verse 37, there's a little story for us about how God got the attention of Nebuchadnezzar. Now I want to be careful this morning. I don't want to be misunderstood this morning. I am not saying this morning that this COVID-19 virus and pandemic was sent just so that God can get our attention. But I would say that God wants to get our attention through it. I'm not here to say that, that God is just saying this is judgment, though he could, his ways are above our ways. But I know that he wants to accomplish something through it. And he wants to get a hold of my heart and your heart each and every day. And God knows how to get my attention and knows how to get your attention. My boys have said that I have a look. Now, I don't know what that means, but, but I do know that, that the other day or a little while back, we're at the, uh, walking the lunchroom, and Johnny, my oldest, 11-year-old, runs up to me and says, Hey, Daddy, come here. Will you please give us your look and show it to CJ? It was CJ, wasn't it? He wants to see it. Now, I can't give the look on command. I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not made that way. It kind of just flows naturally. You know, it just flows out from my toes when something happens that you know, demands the look. You know, maybe the boys have decided to paint inside on the carpet and they're good clothes. I don't know, something like that. But, but, but he said, Dad, we give him the look and, and I couldn't bring the look out. I just begin to crack up and smirk. But there are those times, apparently, all right, maybe my boys are, are lying to me, that the look kind of ekes out. And they don't mistake the look for anything else when it ekes out, do you, boys? You know what the look is? And they know that it demands a response and apparently the response is one of obedience apparently I don't know what this look holds but it holds some type of attention grabbing properties well God wants to get my attention wants to get your attention I wonder how did Nebuchadnezzar the most powerful king at that time the most powerful potentate at that time how did God get his attention well, Daniel chapter 4 tells us. How did the powerful ruler of a pagan nation turn to God? You know, if I was writing this chapter on how to get a hold of Nebuchadnezzar's attention, I would have wrote it differently, perhaps. 
You would have voted differently. We would have thought, well, this will get his attention. And uh, we'll look at some of those things this morning. But God in his wisdom and his power and his understanding knows exactly how to get someone's attention. And this morning, I hope that God can get my attention and your attention. So we can be still and know that he is God. To know what God has for us. This morning, I want to look at the story of repentance from Nebuchadnezzar. Lord, I thank you for this time and these moments that we have. Lord, I ask that you would help me as I speak to say those things that would be true to your word, that would be a help to people. And Lord, if there's something that maybe I'm thinking to say that would not be beneficial, would not be helpful, would not glorify you, Lord, would you strike it from my mind and my lips? Lord, I've tried to study and do my part, but... I am just a human being, and I need your power. Lord, I ask for all those who are listening that you would help the distractions to be at a minimum. But so many ways the devil would love to distract us from the power of your word and the profit of your word. Lord, those at home, would you please bind the devil and his demons? Lord, those who maybe are not a part of our church but are listening this morning, would you work in their heart as well? Lord, there may be someone this morning who's never turned towards you. Lord, I ask that this morning, today would be the day that they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I look at this chapter, Daniel chapter 4. And Daniel is just a, a very interesting, intriguing book. A lot of interesting details for us, a lot of neat facts. A lot of neat revelations from the Lord. And this morning I want to look at, first of all, one of those revelations. And I see the revelation that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar. I find it in the, in the first few verses, uh, verses 4 through uh, verse number 8, I see the revelation that was given. When the Bible says that, in, in verse 4, that Nebuchadnezzar was uh, resting in his house at home. That's something that we are almost all doing right now, is it not? I mean, we don't have much of a choice. We can rest at home. I was coming home last night from men's prayer meeting that we had here late. And as I'm driving down the road, it was, it was kind of eerie to see everything shut down on Dixie Highway. No McDonald's, no Wendy's, no Taco Bell. No problem with that one. And we have some time at home right now, don't we? Some time with family, a blessing, absolute blessing. There was a revelation, there was a revealing that Nebuchadnezzar had. He had another dream. Verse number 5 tells us he saw a dream. I want to mention again, like I mentioned when I preached on chapter 2, that though God can still work through dreams, He chooses now to reveal Himself through His Word and through His Spirit. Right? Please don't call me and say, Pastor, I had a, a crazy dream. I think God is trying to reveal something to me. Okay, unless that dream involves buying me a Ferrari, then that is obviously of the Lord, okay? Anything short of that is not, but that one's of the Lord. No, of course, I jest. God does not reveal himself in dreams. Now, though he could, he's still God. He can do whatever he wants to, and they're not the method of communication that God uses, but he did in the Bible time, and he did with Nebuchadnezzar. He came to Nebuchadnezzar with another disturbing dream. I've had disturbing dreams before. Dreams that you wake up and, and you're in a sweat or, or, you, or you're falling and then you... I, I guess they say if you actually hit the ground, you die. I don't know how you test that theory. Like, oh, they must hit the ground, they're dead. You know, you look flat on the bed. I don't know. But he had a disturbing dream. So disturbing that he called all the wise men in. Last but not least in Daniel chapter 4, verse number 8, Daniel came in before me. But when I read that and was studying this passage, I thought of this, that, that I'd read that before. Last time in Daniel chapter 2 that this happened, Daniel was the last guy in. So somehow Daniel is always last to the show in this operation. At last, Daniel came in the first time. He had to come in this time. Nebuchadnezzar called him in, but Daniel was last. And almost you could stop there and say, oh boy, I know how this ends. Like every Disney story, right? You know, comes off, starts off with some problem and some, you know, prince and then some ugly maid. And by the end, they live happily ever after. Oh, I, I know how this story ends. You would think, of course, as Daniel comes in, that he would say, I know how this story ends. But there's something interesting I'd like you to look at in verse number 8 when Daniel comes in. This is Nebuchadnezzar kind of penning these words, but the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar according to the name of my God. 
and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told him the dream, saying... I noticed when I was studying that, that it says that Daniel, that Nebuchadnezzar, mentioned that he had called him Belteshazzar, which was named after his God. All right, Not the God of the universe, not God Almighty, not Jehovah, but Baal. And, 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 and it was a reminder of his false God. It was a holdout to false worship. I wonder, as God tries to get our attention, if there's not a holdout in our life that references something that is a false God or a false deity or a false worship or something that we are saved from before. You know, if we leave a beachhead for the devil, he will eventually take over our life again. The Bible says, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. I remember the man who was trying to get rid of rock music. Kept just one CD. Before long, he's back in rock music. Because he left a reminder of a false God and false worship. The person who wanted to get rid of, of a security blanket of lust, yet left one app installed on their phone. Before long, back in lust. You see, the the devil is not looking for a lot of space. He's looking for a little bit of space. And he'll take that little bit of space and he'll make it a lot of space. As I read that verse in verse number 8, I could not help but but think that even the name of Daniel, Daniel will always worship the Lord. Throughout the whole book of Daniel, we never have Daniel wavering, always in, in worship and his heart turned toward God. Yet Nebuchadnezzar said, I named him Belteshazzar. He was named after my faults. God, I wonder if there's a place of holdout in your life. Then I see, not only the revelation, I see the request. Starting in verse number 9 through verse 27, a large portion of the chapter, it's given over to what Daniel said and how he interpreted the dream. In the first few verses, he he's, hears a dream and he, he starts to talk about it. And then, and then the Bible tells us, in verse number 19, after Daniel knew of the dream, that he was astonished, astonished for one hour. Daniel for one hour apparently did not answer the king. It wasn't because uh, apparently in the scripture that Daniel didn't know what it was. It was because it bothered him so much. The message he was about to give to the king wasn't a pleasant message. It wasn't a good message. It wasn't a, hey, you've just won publisher's clearinghouse message. It was a terrible message. It was a hard message. And this was a pagan king, a, a hard king. And for one hour, for one hour he was troubled. And finally the king said, listen, don't let this dream trouble you. Tell me what's bothering you. Apparently he was bothered so much that it showed on his countenance and the king understood. There's a problem here. Can I challenge us about this? We need to be willing to speak the truth. We need to be willing to speak the truth. Daniel had a choice to make at that point. He could, he could speak what he knew God was telling him, or he could make up something like all the other wise men, the Chaldeans and false prophets often did in Scripture, did they not? Giving blessings and telling wonderful things. Boy, boy, this is going to be wonderful. It'll be perfect for you. But that's not what God's message was. Unfortunately, I've seen pastors who do this. Now, not here at First Baptist Church and definitely not Pastor Let, but sometimes you can turn them on TV and they're going to preach a message that, boy, everything will turn out right. Just send us some money and your life will be grand. It's a false message. It's not real. You can send them money. They'll get the money, but that doesn't mean your life will be grand. I saw one that was in trouble recently for trying to sell a COVID-19 cure. The government came after him. Listen, I don't have a cure and I'm not trying to sell you a cure. But, but they'll tell you things like, listen, God just wants to bless you, and God does want to bless you. But God also has some truth, and the truth is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Anyone who says otherwise, if anyone says you can get to heaven any other way, they're not speaking the truth. Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's the only one who can save you from your sins. He's the only one who can guarantee you a home in heaven and a home with Him forever. Anyone who says otherwise is a liar. And Daniel shared the truth. 
It's amazing that God had Daniel in a foreign land for a foreign pagan king and used him to deliver a powerful message. That's just the way of the Lord, to, to, to work in circumstances that we don't understand. We think, how is this going to work out? What is God doing? And then God begins to pull back the curtain, and we look and say, wow, God, you used Daniel, even though he was taken from his home and put in a strange place, you used him to influence an entire nation. You see, God wants to do something much bigger than we can see, and he wants to use men and women who are willing to speak the truth. I hate those questions when they start with, now Pastor Howell, now Brother Howell, I need an honest opinion about this. They're never positive. It's never, it's never like, wow, um, you know, sh should I buy the BMW or the Ferrari? It's, it's, do you like this? What do you think of this? And they're looking for honesty. I realized a long time ago that I am that guy. If you ask me, I'm going to tell you. So I have to sleep with my own head at night and close my own eyes and sleep with myself and I can't not do that. I did read this story, though. A husband was coming out of anesthesia after a series of tests at the hospital. His wife was sitting by the bedside, and when his eyes fluttered open, he said, You are beautiful. Flattered, the wife continued the vigil. Later, he woke up again and said, You're cute. What happened to beautiful, she asked. Well, the drugs are wearing off, her husband replied. <laughs> I would just read that as a story. It wasn't real. But I noticed in this passage in verse number 27, if I can take your attention there. After Daniel told the king what would happen, he told the king, listen, he said, he said what's going to happen is if you don't turn back to God, you're going to be, you're going to be cast outside. You're going to eat of the dirt. and You're going to be there for seven years. In verse 27, Daniel says this, Wherefore, O king... Let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and to break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it, it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. You see, Daniel, Daniel was asking and begging the king. He was saying, King, would you repent now? Would you let God get your attention before you have to go outside as an animal? Would you let God get a hold of your heart before it's too late? And that's my same uh, question to you today and my same, my, my same uh, point to you today. Would you let God get a hold of your life now before he has to really get your attention? Would you just respond to his word? Maybe there's a Christian who needs to come back to the Lord with his pride, with his money, with his worry. Would you come back before God has to get your attention? Can you not see Daniel before the king saying, King, please, would you please just follow this path, this one. Just turn back to God. Repent of your sins. Repent of your pride. And I noticed, though, the rejection. The rejection. Verses 28 through 30. It says, All this came upon the king, Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months... Daniel walked out and for 12 months, or 11 months and 30 days, nothing happened. Nothing happened for two months or for three months. They didn't use our calendar, but, but March came and April came and life is good. You know, I, I thought Daniel was right, but hey, I'm still the king. I'm still in charge. I still have my own God, still have my own false worship, and, and, and everything is A-OK. -okay. And listen, it's a lie. You're living your life and nothing has happened yet. Do not think that God doesn't care. Don't mistake God's patience and mercy for indifference. And the King Nebuchadnezzar mistook God's patience and his mercy for indifference. Oh, I'm okay right now. Look, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm living like I want to live. I'm spending money what I want to spend money on. I'm making my own decisions. God doesn't care. Oh, he cares, my friend, very, very, very much. See, there's a rejection because Nebuchadnezzar should have known to respond to God. In chapter 1, he saw God bless his children all right, with Daniel and his three friends. In chapter 2, he saw God re was a revealer of secrets and he should have responded. In chapter 3, he should have responded when he saw the Son of God in the fiery furnace, yet still he rejected. There's no way 
But Nebuchadnezzar should have missed it. The furnace, seven times hotter. The Son of God, like him to the Son of God, walking around. And even then, he doesn't turn to God. Even then, even then, his heart is hard. Don't miss it. Don't miss it, friend. Christian, don't miss it. Those who know the, the Lord is your Savior, those who know God's Word, don't miss it. Is God speaking to you? Then turn back to Him. Yes. Nebuchadnezzar, it was a rejection. Then, then, I see the reality. I see the reality. Judgment came. Interestingly, interestingly enough, all that happened was found in verse 33. It says, In the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and did eat grass, his oxen, his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Verse 34 begins his repentance, but in verse 33 we have the shortest longest seven years that verse equals seven years of time that nebuchadnezzar was in judgment someone once said time flies when you're having fun i don't think time flew for nebuchadnezzar seven years of eating grass seven years of living outside seven years of being driven from men i wish he had listened to god when the times were good I wish he'd responded to Daniel back in verse 27. I wish that, that he hadn't ha, had to have been driven from his house and his home and his family. And yet, even though I've not been a pastor very long, I've been in this church now for, as an assistant for almost 18 years. And yet I've seen people who have decided to go outside for seven years. Who knew, who heard the preaching from God's word week in, week out. Who knew what God wanted, what God demanded. Who knew what was right and knew what was wrong and yet said, no, I'd rather go outside and eat the grass. I'd rather live like the animals for seven years. When God wants your attention, he'll get your attention. <laughs> but it's not always the attention that you want to have. But I see now at the end of the story, my favorite part, the repentance. Because as we read at the very beginning, don't miss this, Nebuchadnezzar, not only did God get his attention, but Nebuchadnezzar responded the right way. He said that God is first in my life. He's first in the universe. He is who he says he is. He does what he says he does. He deserves what I have to offer. But what is repentance? Change of mind change of direction the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance you now what do we, what do we need to repent for well we can repent for salvation you may be on your own path but God wants you to be on a different path Wabash is a town in a remote portion of Canada for many years it was completely isolated but recently there was a road one road cut through the wilderness to reach it it is only one road into it and one road out of it, the same road. If someone could, they can travel for six to eight hours on an unpaved road to get to Wabash. The only way they could leave is to go back down that road. Each of us at birth arrives in a town called Sin. And there's only one road leading out of that town. And his name is Jesus. But one must first turn around on the road they're on and head the other way toward Jesus. That's repentance. Knowing that there's nothing I can do to pay for my sin, but that Jesus died on the cross as a perfect, perfect Savior. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day. And the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means repent from trusting in myself and not my own works and my own goodness, but believe, turn my mind and my heart to Jesus and believe on Him. That's the road to repentance and salvation. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust Him today? 
Uh, but for the Christian, we need to repent for communication. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You say, Pastor, why does, why does, my, why does my prayer life stink? Maybe because your repentance is not there. Maybe because you've hurt that and repent not only for salvation and communication, but repent for association. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. I love the illustration that Pastor has used. In fact, I was talking to someone the other day and used that analogy again. And Pastor often would say in that verse, if you take one step closer to God, He'll take one step closer to you. So every step toward God is actually two steps, one of His and one of yours. And I like the length of God's steps. They're a lot longer and larger than mine. Is God trying to get your attention today? David Berkowitz is called the son of Sam. A serial killer. He's been incarcerated for more than three decades. He had a murder spree in July of 1976 until August of 1977 when he was arrested. New York City was terrorized not only by his crimes but by his letters that he said he was influenced by his neighbor's dog whose name was Sam. That's why he called himself apparently the son of Sam. He is now 68 years old. He has applied for parole five times and been denied every single time. But a few years back he wrote this letter. I have no interest in parole and no plans to seek release. If you could understand this, I am already a free man. I am not saying this jokingly, I really am. Jesus Christ has already forgiven and pardoned me and I believe this. My main activities are sharing my story of redemption and hope with those. You say, how could Jesus save a serial killer because the power of Jesus is that powerful his salvation is that free and he can save what we would consider the worst among us he said Jesus has given me a whole new life which I do not deserve and while society may never forgive me God has and I'm ever forever grateful for such forgiveness too my friend is God trying to get hold of your attention he's trying to get a hold of you he knows how to like I began at the beginning I don't want to be misunderstood I don't think that God just set the COVID-19 virus just just to get a hold of our attention but I know that he wants to use it to do that and there are some moms and some dads who need to let God get a hold of them there's some sons and daughters who need to let God get a hold of them. I, I hope that during this time that you're home, that you spend more time with God. You let God get a hold of your attention. Put yourself aside. I imagine there's some folks who never trusted Christ as their Savior. But because of this, the reality, that they'll let Jesus become their Savior. Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask that you would Show us clearly in our hearts what you want to accomplish. Lord, I would ask that you help us to be honest. If you're trying to get a hold of us, Lord, to work on us. To make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. That we would see that clearly. Lord, that we would realize where we need to turn back to you. Lord, I pray that for those who don't know you as your Savior, that they would trust you today. I want to ask you something, my friend. I wonder if God spoke to your heart today. In just a moment, we'll have the piano play, and whether you're at home on live stream or here in the auditorium, I would ask that you would bend a knee. Those who are here may wish to come to the altar. At home, you may get off your chair and pray and ask God to help you. But I wonder also if there's someone who's under the sound of my voice today who doesn't know you as their Savior. Would you trust Christ today? The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you can trust Him today. Often we help someone pray a prayer like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. But I believe
believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you pray that today? You can pray right from your heart. He'll hear you. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. Oh, my friend, that's the, the best repentance there ever is. Turn our direction from sin to our Savior. How about a Christian? Is the Lord trying to get your attention? Would you let him have it before you have to go outside for seven years? Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for using it in my heart and the hearts of those who hear. Lord, I pray that all that you want to be accomplished would be accomplished. Lord, if there's someone out there who needs to respond to you for salvation, that they would do that today. In Jesus' name, amen.